during that time. So um, there are fiction units and nonfiction units that the kids are involved in, and we have seen so much excitement from these kids about just reading. They've read more than they've ever read before. They're able to talk about books more than they ever have before, and so we really are excited about it at our school. We think it's going great. So on that note, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Ro, and I'm gonna let her talk to you about one of the things that sometimes is a concern from parents is, so the kids are reading all this stuff, and there aren't a lot of worksheets or anything, so how are you getting some grades? And so that's one of the things that we thought was important to talk to you about, and that's kind of where the focus is gonna go. So, hi. Uh, so when we think about Reader's Workshop in three through five, we want you to know, for those that have children that are younger, um, we want you to know what's coming for your kids. And what's coming for your kids is a passion for reading that you have probably never experienced before for your children. Um, Reader's Workshop is an hour long block. So in that hour, the very first thing that happens is there's a mini lesson. And in the mini lesson, you are making a connection to either a lesson that happened before or you're connecting to your kids' lives and you're saying, so this is what happened. And, um, and then that follows very quickly with a teaching point. So, um, so last night I was reading at home with my kids. Now you should know that my kids are 21, 20, and 25. <laughs> but um, last night I was reading with Andrew because even though he's 20 friends, he still loves to read. And so we were reading, and we chose this book, and we were making predictions. And I thought, you know what? As a good reader, it's really important, no matter how old you are, to make predictions. So then that got me thinking, today what I want to teach you is that when you're reading, it's really important to not only predict while you're reading, but also predict before you start reading. And you're going to continue to predict throughout the whole book, and you're going to check your predictions. So you're telling it as it unfolds in this beautiful story. Sometimes your stories are true. So sometimes your kids are coming home and they're saying, Mrs. Surma said da 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 da, and then you know, no, probably not. That's not probably what happened. <laughs> but, um, but, so they, they do this beautiful lesson. And then for the majority of the time, so about 40 minutes, your child and, or children are spending time reading books that are important for them in genres that they might not have ever read before. And while your kids are reading, it's up to our wonderful teachers to sit with them and to decide and use assessments to decide what is it that we need to work on? What do you need to work on individually as a student? What do you need to work on in small groups? Does that part make sense? And then after they get done reading, we kind of wrap it up. So this small amount of time is where the teacher is in charge. And the rest of the time, your kids are reading books that are at their independent reading level. So the next question that we usually get asked is, okay, so that's great, but what about the SOLs? And what about my child doesn't like to read and my, or my child loves nonfiction? They don't really read anything else. The great thing about Reader's Workshop, which I'm gonna back up just for a second, Reader's Workshop actually originated in New York City with Lucy Hawkins through Columbia University Teachers College. And many, many schools within New York City and throughout the country and throughout the whole world do Reader's Workshop. And so if you want a little background in that, please feel free to ask or send an email and we'll be sure to get that information to you. It's not just some random thing that, that Melanie and I were like, okay, so let's, I have an idea, <laughs> let's do. So it's backed with a lot of research. So I didn't, I'm sorry for not including that before. Um, but through this research, what they decide is what's appropriate for third graders to learn about what's appropriate for fourth graders, fifth graders, and it actually follows through into middle school. So Harmony Middle School actually does Reader's Workshop as well. Um, so it follows them. Um, so some of the units of study that your third graders or future third graders are gonna learn about, they spend two units in nonfiction. They learn how to research. They learn um, about mysteries. They talk about characters. They learn how to be part of a workshop. 
and when your kids, does anyone have third graders right here? Okay. So when your kids came home the first month of school, they were talking about how they were building a reading life and building their stamina for reading and how they had to keep a reading log and a reading journal and they were learning all sorts of fantastic things about just themselves as readers. And that's a really important part of workshop is you need to know yourself as a reader and we need to build stamina. So um, in addition to that, there's also a unit on test taking, but um, your kids become experts in those units. What your teachers usually ask you is when they're in that unit of study, that's what they're reading in school. So when our kids say, I'm not a lover of nonfiction, then we value that and say, we understand that. But for this month, this five week of weeks of time, we are going to try to make you a lover of nonfiction. And it's our job, your teacher's job, to put books in their hands that are gonna help them to think about nonfiction in a way that they've never thought about nonfiction before. And also teach them really important lessons about main idea and details. How to look at nonfiction, interesting versus important. So things like that. Um, I'm going to move on to fourth grade. In fourth grade, we build off of everything that they've learned in third grade. But in addition to that, they study the American Revolution through research clubs. They have a science unit that's based in research clubs. They do historical fiction. Um, they also will do a fantasy unit. They'll also do a test taking unit. So those are important things and I'm missing one and I can't for the life of me think of what it is. They also do characters, I thought. Mm -hmm. I thought they did this. They do, I can't, interpretive book sets. Yes, sorry, you were right and I was wrong. I can, <laughs> did everybody hear that? Yeah. <laughs> you want me to say it one more time? <laughs> you were right and I was oh, wrong. Characters. It's characters, it's characters. Um, but they do it in a little bit of a different way. I usually don't ever talk to Melanie like that. I just want to set that for the record. Right now. <laughs> so um, she's always right. Um, and so again, we're taking what, you, they, what we've taught them in third grade and then we're asking them to do a little bit more. We're asking them to be more independent. We're asking them to do research projects in small groups to help each other. Because as Mr. Davis said, we want our kids to be empowered and we want to prepare them so that they can have conversations, so that they can become experts on things, so that they can learn and teach somebody else and be able to represent Round Hill as well as you in a really positive way. And so we're really working on these things and the units of study really help your kids do those types of things. In fifth grade, fifth grade is like a whole big ball of wax of like, okay, so now that you're in fifth grade, now all of a sudden you're doing all of these fantastic things. They also study characters, but they do it in dip with the same author in different types of books. So not only are they looking at one book, they're comparing three different books that by the same author. And they're looking at them and seeing what are the similarities, what are the differences. Um, they're really deep into fantasy. They learn how to have an argument. Moms, look at me. <laughs> we do not teach them how to argue back about bedtime, about snacks, about what they can watch on TV. But we do teach them how to research, how to study both sides of an argument, and how to do it in a respectful way so that you can get your point across and you can also learn that sometimes your perspective can be changed by listening to others. Um, they also do a test prep unit. So those are the types of things that your students are learning in grades three through five. Any thoughts or questions about that? Have you noticed that your kids are reading more? Have you noticed them saying that they're like really loving reading in school? I see a lot of hands, yes. Yeah, that's our goal. We want kids to love reading and then we accidentally wanna slip in all of those really important things. <laughs> so that way they're learning all about how to be a great reader. And um, so that's really helpful. You know, something else that I'm gonna prompt you to talk a little bit more about because I've learned, because I'm learning along with these teachers and with all our teachers is thinking. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of thinking and what we're working with the kids on in terms of that Being piece? Being thoughtful thinkers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so 
when your students are reading, um, I'm going to piggyback off of what Andrew had said, but with assessment. So we're not just sending them off to read, and then we're we have to, we're assessing constantly, assessing constantly, seeing. Okay, so this is where the strengths are. These are the things I need to work on. So within doing that, we have conversations. So what are you working on as a reader? That comes up a lot. I don't know if your kids have talked a little bit about that, but that's usually what your teachers will ask. So what are you working on as a reader? And your kids will say things like, I'm working on making predictions. I'm working on main idea and details. I'm working on talking back to my text. I'm working on using my sticky notes to track my thinking. So they're doing things like that. Your teachers are taking those sticky notes and they're using them as ways to assess. And when they've assessed, then they're building new strategy groups and they're building more one-on-one -on -one conferences and they're having guided reading groups if necessary. So in part of that, um, one way to think about that is we're asking kids to think about books the way that they've never thought about books before and to be really thoughtful thinkers. We don't want to know that the girl's dress was red. And we want them to really stop being surface level thinkers and to really think deeply and to be able to have conversations. And in the workshop model, that's really one of our main goals is how to be a thinker and how to be able to communicate your thoughts. So when we ask your kids to use sticky notes, we're not just saying like jot down your thoughts, which we are, but then we're also saying, so here are your thoughts, write long about that, talk long about that. So we can teach them how to have conversations with each other, with their teachers, with their peers, um, and it allows them to really be able to kind of process what they're thinking and take that, what they're learning, and put it into other perspectives. I don't know if that answered your question or, or not. It did. Do you want to add anything, Mel? No? Okay. So, um, some of your teachers have started this, but this is pretty new. So, it's, it's really voluntary right now, but one way that we assess students is we give a pre-assessment and we give a post-assessment. And in that assessment, we're saying, okay, so let's see, are they able to make predictions? Are they able to infer? How are they doing with drawing conclusions? And so they're doing those things and we're asking them to read a passage. So the passage is, it's a reading test and we're checking their comprehension. So we're asking them to either read the passage or somebody will read the passage to them if it's not at their independent reading level and they're gonna answer questions. And then based on that information, we see, okay, so these are the types of things we have to work on in this unit. And then at the end of the unit, we see how much progress was made. These are brand new um, for your teachers. So some of them have jumped on that and some of them are really just kind of, it's gonna take a minute and they're getting assessments in other ways. So please don't be alarmed if your teachers haven't brought those up because it's really just right now, it's, it's a voluntary thing. Okay. Um, through anecdotal notes. So how many of you have seen more sticky notes than you possibly could ever want? Yeah. <laughs> We're sorry. We're sorry, oh, on the floor, in their pants, in the washing machine, in the dryer, underneath their shoe. Um, our librarian has said, please, 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 I'm begging you, have them take their sticky notes out of the books before you return them. And the, our kids do try, they just can't get them all. So um, we ask them to track their thinking while they're reading. So when you're, how can you help your kids when you're reading to them at night? You can say, hmm, I wonder why, or I never thought about, so modeling your thinking for your kids. That's a great way to help them be better readers and better thinkers, is just showing them how you think about something. Because when you show kids how you do something, that's how they learn to be that type of thinker. So um, we're asking them to track their thinking. And then we take these 
and we assess it. We can also use anecdotal notes through running records. So those are different types of ways that we do it. Um, and you're probably starting to see some rubrics coming home. So, um, and if you're not, that's okay, again. But some of our teachers have started using rubrics. And um, so you might see a, a sticky note or an assessment, and then there's a rubric on the top of it. And the rubric is used so that, um, I hate to say this to you moms, but it's really to help your students. Now we're sending it home to you, but we really want your students to be able to self-assess. So that way you can say, okay, if I want to be a four, this is the type of thinking that I have to do. If I want to be a three, so I'm a three right now, how do I get myself from a three to a four? What type of things do I have to do in order to do that? Your teachers are working so hard to help your kids be more self-reflective of, don't ask me what you need to do. Here's the rubric. So you, you can decide how you want to be a better reader and how you want to be able to draw conclusions. So, um, so these types of rubrics, that's just an example of one, but um, these are the types of things that are gonna be coming home. Melanie, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, the only thing that I would add, and I think you touched on this a little, is just that sometimes when I think as parents, we think about assessment, what we're really thinking is grades. But when teachers think assessment, what we're really thinking is, okay, so what, what do we see about these kids that they already have? And where do we see that they need to go? And that's how we're using a lot of these assessments. So while we understand that there needs to be grading involved, and these are some great ways to get grades for the report card, and this is how we are assessing kids in that way, just think about thinking about assessment in a different way is this is how our instruction is being guided. When we're talking about that big chunk of time when kids are reading in the classroom, that 40 minutes, the teachers are using that assessment to say, okay, so during this 40 minutes of time when everybody's reading, I know from looking at this assessment that these three kids need to sit with me and this is what we need to work on. Or that this student needs to sit with me and this is what he really needs to work on today. So assessments for teachers are a little bit different than assessments for parents. So I think that this is both things, but just kind of to keep that in perspective, uh, you know, for you, we're using it to, yes, put grades in the grade book, but for us, and I think they would all agree, all the teachers sitting here, that the benefit for us isn't really that. It's we need we are observing your kids and where they are through all of these different things, and that's helping us to teach them what they need to know from where they are. So where are your kids right now? Right now, your third graders are starting nonfiction. They are going to be really deep into main idea and details. They are going to become experts. They're going to be experts. They're going to come home and they're going to tell you all sorts of things and you're going to go, good. <laughs> but now it's time for you to go to bed. But um, they are going to become experts. They are going to learn how to read nonfiction, which is so much different than reading fiction, which is what they've done so far this year. Your fourth graders are learning about the American Revolution. but they're researching through the American Revolution. So your fourth graders are choosing topics. They're choosing the subtopics to research the Boston Tea Party and the um, Revolutionary War and people that I haven't heard of because I'm not from Virginia, but mm -hmm. all sorts of, and they're choosing subtopics and they're learning about how to research. And your fifth graders are going into a fantasy unit. And so they are going to learn about fantasy through book clubs. Um, so a lot of working together and a lot of just conversations. Does anyone want to add anything that's has more expertise than Do you have any questions for us? We hope that your kids are loving reading. It's our hope and our goal that they will come home every day on fire about reading because we are on fire about reading. And, um, and we thank you for letting us take some time to just give you a little information.